Hey, well, welcome. This is Hobie 201. It's a graduate level course. So we've all assumed you've managed your way through 101 and 102. Um, and what inspired me to offer this course, it's being offered actually for the first time, is that I've done a lot of, uh, I've had a lot of coaching. I've been into a lot of seminars. And I began to realize after last summer that there's a lot that I'm doing that isn't being talked about. And I think, and as I was going around a, a weather mark, I noticed uh, Dan Borg was doing something that nobody had ever told me to do until about a year ago. And I've been sailing Hobies now for 30 some odd years and no one ever told me this stuff. And if you don't know, you won't do it. So I decided uh, to offer this up, hopefully, uh, there's some great stuff in here that you can utilize. The re we're taping this. Hopefully, uh, uh, that it'll go to the end. It's going to be a long tape. Maybe we'll break it up. What I want you guys to try to do is just come away with one or two things today. And hopefully we'll have the tape that you can go back. And after you've matriculated those one or two things, you can watch the tape again, pick up another couple of items, and just keep doing that and, and, and gradually build. You're not going to get it all in, in, in one sitting. Uh, so what we're not going to cover today is um, just sailing a Hobie. That's 101 that's going on next door. We're not going to talk about too much about the actual race course and what happens on the race course. That's in 102. In this course, we're gonna, I'm intending to take it to the next level. A lot of the intangibles, uh, a lot of the stuff that quite frankly, the little stuff. And what I've learned, uh, I, have some, I have some training in science, so you have to excuse me for that. But basically, if this is time and, and um, this is incremental of, increments of knowledge, I guess, I was thinking about this. It goes something like that. By that I mean, when you're early in your hobby career, it doesn't take much to learn a big speed difference. In your first regatta or two, you know, all of a sudden you learn how to tack or drive, and all of a sudden, you know, it's magic. Um, but when you have you been sailing a few years, that's small. It might take you several years just to get a small little bit of. Uh, of advantage. And that's what we're going to talk about in 201. We're going to talk about how to accelerate this process so you don't have to take 32 years like some people did um, to, to find out, you know, some of these things. Um, I, should, I should back up and also say, I've never won a world championship. I've never won a national championship. Uh, I've been sailing Obies for about 30 some odd years. And uh, I've gotten a lot better over those years. And sometimes the best uh, teachers aren't always the, uh, the best sailors. Meaning, you talk to some of the top sailors, and I've done this. Well, how come? Why are you so fast? And, well, I don't know. I just kind of do what I do. And, uh, and I've introspectively looked. And, and, and so this is what I'm offering up in, uh, in a distilled format today. So. Uh, we'll probably take a break mid-morning uh, and then keep going. There's some bathrooms, I think, in the classroom next door in 101. Uh, any questions so far? Okay. So, I was reading a Sailing World article, uh, and there was a gentleman in there uh, in the back of, of the, the best parts are in the back, I think. A guy by the name of James Line, and I'll agree I don't know him, and I also agree that for a sailor, that's a great name. Hi, my name's James Lyon. Uh, <laughs> this guy coached four, count them, four world championships in 2016. The TP52, the FAR40, the Melchus32, and a fourth one that I can't remember. Fairly competitive classes. <laughs> a lot of money on the line. This guy coached four world championships. I thought he probably knows what he's talking about in here. And this is what he said. Everybody knows how to sail upwind and downwind. 
but it's the aggregation of thousands of tiny gains, which individually wouldn't make a difference in a race, that collectively make a huge difference. Yes. In one design sailing, the difference is more pronounced. If you're 0.1% faster than the competition, you're guaranteed to win 80% of the races. If you're even just 1% faster, it's game over. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, is those small little idiosyncrasies and nuances that can gain you that extra 1%, maybe even 0.1%. Now, I realize you may or may not be there yet in your sailing career, but hopefully with these notes, you'll be able to get there. That was profound when I read that because I can remember 20 some odd years ago, and I'm, I'm taking shackles off my boat. And I didn't know why. I, you know, I just knew that it was going to be lighter if I did. And I just kept, and I cut the tails off of excess line. And I, people would, would mock me and, and stuff like that, but I just kept doing it. And what I found was that I was winning the races. And that actually speaks more towards boat preparation, which we're going to get into here. Uh, well, I guess we're into it now. That talks really into boat preparation because in, I would say, 80% of the races, the race is won before the boats hit the water. It's because of the preparation that's gone on. The, 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 the tasking on the boat, to getting rid of that little shackle, um, going out and training with your partner is preparation. Just the, the nuances and idiots, not leaving anything undone, spending the time. You've read the term, uh, uh, time on the water. Uh, that is a big part. Training and training with uh, my crew and I have trained countless hours out in Puget Sound. Just, we'll just do, let's do 20 tacks, all right? Let's do 20 jibes. Let's do, and you know this too. It, uh, John knows this. It's just, you just pound it in and you get repetition over and over and over. And if you look at any high level athlete, yeah, whether it's, and it's particularly pronounced in a golfer, it's being able to repeat the motion over and over again that separates it. So, um, so it's in the preparation. And the easy part is the boat. You can spend all the time in the world with your boat in the, in the driveway and just going over it and, and looking at new ways to make it just a little bit faster. Um, put it on a diet, look at lines. Is there any way I can reduce uh, my, my tram placing instead of using that big old half inch, you know, whatever, you know, use some high tech line that's strong and light, stuff like that, all right? Um, it's also though, it's mental preparation. It's, it's having the confidence, and sometimes you have to fake it till you make it, but it's having the confidence to say, I belong here. Maybe you will or maybe you won't win that regatta, but you have to have the confidence that you belong on that starting line and on that course. And, and you have to, as a skipper, it's, it's, it's incumbent on the skipper to instill that confidence in the crew, and it's, and it's incumbent on the crew to build that skipper up and build that confidence within the skipper. It's a team effort. If the crew is tearing the skipper down, it's the worst thing that can possibly happen uh, because we all have our own questions, our own inadequacies, and things like that. And so you want, as a crew, you want to build that skipper. Man, that was great. Keep it positive. And, and ditto on the skipper, the skipper to the crew. Um, if, you're young, if you're a skipper and you're yelling at your crew, you won't be yelling for long. <laughs> all right? That should be pretty obvious. All right? It doesn't work. All right? I tried it. <laughs> it doesn't work. Um, and so you want to, it's a positive thing. Yeah, stuff happens, man. It's critical components. And, and the team gets stronger by getting through those difficulties. I get that. All right? So 
I understand how yelling can occur. If it's a regular part of the diet, you're, you're not gonna you're not gonna succeed, uh, and that's in in life or boating. Boating has a lot of parallels uh, with life, uh, as I've come to learn. Um, you're gonna want to um, when you're uh, when you're driving to so there's there's preparation which you can do right now in advance of, of the next regatta. As you're driving to that regatta, or in the week coming up to it. Start asking yourself, how big could I expect that fleet to be? Um, who's going to be the major players there? What kind of conditions am I expected to have? Recognizing, of course, that <laughs> on that score, whatever you expect, probably won't happen. <laughs> but, oh, that's a lighter regatta. I mean, how many times, I, I can't tell you how many times I've had somebody come up to me and say, well, which way should I go? And I'm like, well, I And get practice at sailing slow and controlling your boat. Pull up next to a buoy. There's no boats around it. And just learn how to park next to that buoy. And now you'll understand how you can park next to some other boats. And that will gain you confidence on the start line. It will help you be relaxed and be a better starter. To this day, especially at the bigger events. I, um, when I'm in that five minute sequence, I still take two huge deep breaths. I can't tell you how relaxing that is. I'll be uh, at about two minutes, two and a half minutes. You, you can look over at my boat and there I am, inhaling and exhaling, because I just need to be relaxed. And you're getting all amped up, just take it down, all right? And there's. And different people have different ways of doing that. For me, I have found the deep breaths to work. Have fun. Don't take this so seriously. <laughs> I'm looking over here because I have a bunch. Learn to have fun, all right? Put, th put that race, put that regatta in the context of your whole life. And I was out in Bear Lake at a North American's and I was sailing with my wife, who doesn't sail that much. We weren't doing well in the regatta. We were doing a lot worse than I expected. You go into these regattas expecting a certain level of performance. And I can tell you, about 50% of the time, you do better than you expect, and about 50% you do worse. But anyhow, I had certain expectations, and we weren't meeting those expectations. But in this one race, we had pulled out the luck of the draw, and we rounded that weather mark in like, I don't know, maybe 10th or 13th at a national. So it's like, wow, this was really good. This is about 20 years ago. I'm like, oh my God. And we're on this beam reach. And, the, and I'm just having a kick ass time. I am just, yeah, you know, and I'm cheating on. My wife, who's not used to sailing, she's on the trampoline and she's going, or excuse me, we weren't married at the time. My future wife, and I was, go and I was going to propose to her. Uh, or I did propose to her at that event. So she was my future wife. She was my fiance at the time. And she's on the trampoline. She's going, make it stop. Make it stop. And, and there I am. I'm barreling along in Mach 5. And I've got to make a snap decision. Do I want to lose the race or do I want to lose my wife? You know? It didn't take me long and I'm happily married to this day. Uh, and I'll tell you how we finished in that race. But... But you, and you got to take care of your crew, but you also have to put this whole thing in perspective and make sure you have fun, all right? And I continue to learn that to that day. Um, and then you got to dance with who brought you. And that means that we all have bad days. So it's, it, you know, it, it's a team effort. And it's okay for, that, for the team member to have a bad day. And you don't yell at them because of it. And it's very uh, enriching. Okay. Something else that uh, we tried, we've done, my crew and I have done, Laura Sullivan's my crew, we've been sailing together, I don't know, long enough to know better, 15 years? Right. We've done this, I don't know if we've done it every year, 
we did for several years in the, in the beginning, and that is to uh, put list your three strengths and your three weaknesses. What are your three strengths and what are your three weaknesses? And this helps you to evaluate where the team is, okay? And um, and and, uh, and you just write them down separately, be honest, and then share them, and then build a strategy around those weaknesses and strengths, accept your crew's weaknesses and their strengths. It's easy to accept their strengths, accept their weaknesses too. Recognize, no, we're not all perfect. I'm gonna share with you my three strengths and weaknesses um, so you get an idea of kind of the stuff that, that um, I'm talking about. My three strengths is one is I love to start. I just love starts. I will sit there and I go on YouTube and I just love watching starts and, and, and my own starts and everything else. And it turns out that if you love to do something, you're probably going to be pretty good at it. And it turns out I'm a really good starter. I just have to figure out the rest of the race course. All right? uh, and, and so that, there's, there's a tip there that if you're not a good starter, it may be because you're scared or intimidated or you don't like it. Uh, and you just have to, and, and, and so you have to be introspective and learn why that is. Um, I think I'm a pretty good tactician. Right? I think I can figure my way around the course pretty good. Uh, I make mistakes, uh, we all do, but I think I'm definitely above average on that level. And I think I'm physically strong. I figure I'm about, I'm stronger than most of the people out there, and I can use that to my advantage. And it's okay to, it's okay to admit those things, you know? It, I'm, I'm not trying to be pompous about it, I'm just, okay, this is what I can do. Because I also know that I got three weaknesses. <laughs> As you probably have more than that, but I'm only gonna list three. Um, <laughs> one is, is that I'm an emotional person, and I have to learn to control those emotions on the race course, all right? And I've gotten better at it, still working on it. Another one is I have poor eyesight. So I don't know where that weather mark is. It's up there and over there somewhere. You know, you know, I don't know. But it's over there. So I have to rely on my crew for that. And and the other is that I don't follow my instincts nearly enough. I've been sailing for a long time. I think of myself as a good sailor instinctually, but sometimes I get distracted, I'm looking at the lured hall, I'm doing I got all these bad habits. But those are just some examples. Some of them are physical. There's one more area I want to talk about, and that talks about your, uh, and talks about actually uh, one of my uh, weaknesses, the instinctual part. There's a couple ways to sail sailboats, and on big boats, as, as Tony Hope knows, you can sail by the instruments. Man, you just glued right into those instruments, and you're just sailing totally by them. Or, as my papa used to say, you can just sail by the seat of your pants, just kind of. Oh yeah, I'm in the groove now, baby. All right. You really kind of need, the best approach, I think, personally, is a, is a balance, is a combination of those. Now, on a Hobie cap, we don't have BNG or Raymarine electronics. We are allowed now to have a tactic. But we don't have electronics. But we do have telltales. Um, and if they're well placed, they're good. Uh, and we have other technical things that we can look at, how, how we're doing compared to other boats. Um, and then there's just the gut feel, how, how things feel. On a Hobie cap, it tends to balance more towards the gut feel because there are fewer electronics, uh, a current speed over ground, course over ground. We just don't have that on a Hobie, um, but we can use a lot of those, a lot of the technical signs out there. Another technical sign might be, which way is the smoke blowing off of that chimney? You know, or how fast. So there are other things that you can use. Um, I learned a long time ago, there's a great, great guy, Laura hates him, I love him. His name is Stuart Walker. He's really difficult to read and I absolutely love his writing. Um, and Stuart, I think it was Stuart, has broken uh, winning into three things. The first is boat speed, the second is crew work, and the third is tactics or strategy. 
And we're going to break these three down. Um, and it actually, in terms of, in that sailing world, there was another article the following month issue. And it, and it talked about, um, can we close that door by any chance? Um, thanks, Paul. And, and in that article, this guy was talking about, um, he's, he's, a, he's a world champion in the J-24, uh, actually sailed against his son a couple of times. Uh, and what he likes to do with his crew, and we're adopting this on our team also, is to say, well, I wonder what kind of day is it going to be today? Well, what do you mean by that? Well. Is it going to be a uh, high wind? Do we expect it to be low wind? Do we expect the wind to shift? Uh, is there current? Let's talk about what kind of day is it going to be. And it's interesting because, uh, I don't know, I'm taking a little bit of a detour here on my notes. I don't know if I want to go into this or not. I think I'll save it. I'm going to come back to that. But we're going to talk first about boat speed. This goes back to the preparation. 80, 90% of your boat speed is done before you hit the water. There's only a few adjustments once you get on the water. Down haul, uh, out haul, you know, mass rotation maybe. You know, it's all done by the time you hit the water. And, and really, if, if 90% of it is before you hit the water, then 87% of it is before you hit the beach, <laughs> right? So once you get on the water and you find out you're the slow boat, because I've been here and done this, you're not going to make your boat any faster. So stop getting frustrated over how slow you are and concentrate on, concentrate on what you can control, on what does matter, all right? And, and, and then vow to look up the people who are fast in that fleet to find out how you can make your boat faster for the next day or the next race or the next regatta. But while you're, while you're on the water, I can't tell you how many times, and you're sitting there, oh man, I sure am slow. But now there's a real fast thought. Instead of, all right, which way do I need to go? These guys are a lot faster, but I think the fastest way around the course is da da da. Um, in boat speed, the devil is in the details. When you get to that part of the curve, especially, it's, it, it's all a matter if I could put a theme to today's uh, discussion class is Hobie Caddy is a game of inches. You're gonna, you might win or lose a race by boat lengths, but it's because there's a microcosm, a combination of inches of gain. Going back to that opening. Um, uh, that opening quote from uh, uh, from uh, what was his name? Uh, John uh, Lyon, I think it was. And yeah, and uh, which uh, everybody knows how to sell, but it's the aggregation of thousands of tiny gains, which individually wouldn't make a difference in a race, that collectively make a huge difference. If I can gain two or three inches on every puff or every lull, I can gain two or three boat lengths by the time I get to the weather mark. You understand what I mean? If I can get two or three inches out on you at the start line, it's game over. It is game over. Likewise, if you get a couple inches on me, well, I'm going to give you my alert <laughs> uh, It's a small aggregation. Last year, uh, Laura and I had the opportunity to, to sail down to Guatemala, go, look, travel down to Guatemala and train with Jason Hess. Uh, Jason, at the time we did that, was ranked third or fifth in the world in the Hobie 16. And he had a coach, Emiliano. And I'm down there training with, Emil, uh, with Jason and Emiliano and some other sailors. And uh, Emiliano said, Peter, or maybe it was Jason, get your crew in together. Always be together. And I cannot tell you what a difference that made. Here's, a, here's your standard Hobie trampoline, all right? And I'll just, you know, excuse my, my, my drawing. 
I can't tell you how many times I see, I see crew trapped out like that. Or they're sailing downwind, the skipper's over here, and there's the crew down there on the leeward side, if this was, you know, something like that. It doesn't work that way, you guys. There's yawing that goes on. And while you're there, while you're doing that, Laura and I are sailing right here. And we're balancing our way. Or we're trapped out right there. There's only one exception to this. Only one. And there's always exceptions, right? Only one. In four knots or less of speed, the crew downwind will need to go to the lured hull to hold the jib. But that is the only time you are to be away from it. All other times you are together. If you watch some of the Olympic crews trapping out, they actually will have their legs intertwined where the rear leg of the hull of the crew will be behind the, the front leg of the skipper. They get coached quite a bit, those Olympic athletes. What do you think is important? You think it's better that way or with your crew way out there? All right? It's not going to work. All right? It's really critical. And as a corollary to all this, when we're racing and we see a, a big hit the pin, we got a lucky start, hit the pin, uh, got the pin, start, brand new boat. We had just glued it. I mean, this thing was, it was our, it was our first regatta. We had a competitor off our weather hip. And this, sure enough, there's this power boat wake. And I, I, it was a big wake. I, I told the Lord, I said, look back at our competitor. Okay, watch this. <laughs> and we went through the wake, and I'm not even sure we moved back, but I knew that my boat was, we had just glued it, it was stiff, and I knew that other boat wasn't. And we went through the wake, and when she looked back again, we were like, it wasn't just inches, guys, it was like two boat lengths. I mean, it was huge. Well, the same is true on crew. And so we might be, we might be sailing in, in a really light breeze. Uh, um, Usually upwind, I'm not going to get too technical here, but usually if this is where the shrouds are and here's your mast, well, I guess actually going upwind, in light breeze, if these are where your shrouds are and the mast, in salt water, I differentiate stuff between salt water and fresh water. Okay, hold on. Yeah, Laura. So, uh, so I differentiate between salt water and fresh water. And the reason is, is it's typically fresh water is flat. And typically salt water is usually an open body of water and it's lumpy. Okay. Now, you get out of Lake Washington on a weekend and you're in fresh water and it's lumpy. All right. But um, as a general rule, so in salt water, we are typically right next to each other and usually right at the shrouds. Because we don't we want to reduce that pitching, that yawn. But sometimes if we're if we're maybe we're far forward because we're sailing downwind and as soon as that wake that wake comes, we're always in this area when the, when wake comes. Because that's that's where your center of gravity is on, on a boat. Right. Anything you want to add in on this, John? So far? No, I think it's your point's really good. I I didn't race last weekend, so I got to watch a lot of the racing and I saw a big discrepancy on the crew. I, it's very obvious when you're off a boat watching races, seeing crews apart and then seeing crews that are together. And it looks right when they're together and it looks really weird when they're separated. Mm -hmm. And um, and I noticed it last weekend quite yeah. a bit. And the boats that were usually leading were the crews were close. All the you know it really is important. These are very weight sensitive boats. So, um, I did talk about this. These boats are also weight sensitive. Uh, so, being at or near minimum weight is important. One thing I'm finding out though 
It's, it's not just the, the crew weight, it's your gear weight. If it's a light air day, I am leaving my full harness on the beach now and going out with just a little butt bucket. I leave my, my three pound booties, and that doesn't include when they get wet. They're probably five pounds at that point. I don't wear those now unless it's blowing the oysters off the rocks. And then I need the protection. And then it really doesn't matter how much you take out there anyhow. It's about how much crew weight are you taking out there. Are you, um, I watched Jason S., who I referred to earlier. He had one water bottle that he was taking out on him. And he had built a special preparation. He had specially prepared a special place for that water bottle under his trampoline seat so it wouldn't interfere with his sailing out the center of gravity it's the details it's those minor details that make that difference um, let's get into some rigging uh, tips um, this probably does uh, a crossover to 102 a little bit um, mass rate we all talk about it's pretty important we're finding, if, if you don't know what I'm talking about, see me afterwards, but there's, a, on the Hobie 16, there's now been a fairly standard way of adopting a, a measurement system for measuring mass rate. And we're finding that if you're at or near uh, minimum mass rate, you want to be in the kind of the low 20s, typically. Um, there might be times when you need to power that up and be in the upper teens, but generally speaking, we're running about 22, 23 mass rate. Um, you know, the Hobie 16, it's confounded me for all these decades. because there's, And there's only three strings to pull on the dang thing. It's like, how can this be? How can it be such a complicated boat when it's so simple? Uh, it's a lot of this also got to do with um, rig tension. How much rig tension do you have? Uh, that's a, the jib halyard. It, it determines your rig tension. How much are you putting on there? Generally speaking, I say this with trepidation. A tighter rig will be better than a looser rig, and, but there's a lot of exceptions to that. But generally speaking, a tighter rig will transfer the, the lift from the sails to the hulls. Okay. What I mean, but you can have it too tight, and now the boat feels what I call bound up, and it's slow. Um, you can have it too loose. And it's just sloppy as heck. And what I have learned as a general rule, that if it's light air, I can usually get by with fairly light rig tension. And if it's heavy air, I need that thing on boat and tight. And when it's medium air, it's somewhere in between. Does that make sense? I mean, the stronger the breeze, the more pressure there's going to be on it. So the more you need to really have the rig tighter. And the lighter the breeze, the more you want the boat to breathe. And, and give it a chance to really uh, absorb and move that energy. Do, I, do you agree with that, John? The only thing I'd add is um, in big breeze, there's been times where if the boat's overpowered, I'll let a little of that jib higher off. I'll free it up to give me a little more mastery, which depowers the boat more. Yes. And that can be effective. And that's when it's blowing. Right. When, it's, when it's blowing the oysters off the rocks yeah. and, and you, you're out of control. You, yeah, you can let, that's great, because you can loosen that jib iron. It blows off the top of your main, which is where most of that riding moment is. And so it'll take a lot of that riding moment away and just depower you. So, it, yeah, it's a great, it's a depowering technique. Uh, again, after you're double trapped and after you're, you've been traveling down a couple of three inches and it's still, it's white knuckle sailing, it's scary. Take a couple, take a couple inches off that halyard. Um, you may be, maybe it's a little slower, uh, certain periods of time, you'll be a lot faster than the people that are flipped over that you're going past. <laughs> 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 and, um, and then also just, if, if your boat doesn't, you made a great point, if your boat's not going well, something's off, and it's probably the gym hunter. It, it's You're right, and, and if it just, if you're in light medium conditions, and the boat just doesn't seem like it's going and it's really tight, take half an inch off. No, not two inches, just, just a little bit. It doesn't take much. And the boat will feel better. And the mass will rotate easier. There's, all, there's a lot of things that happen in that, right? And if your mass is count, what we call counter-rotating, you sheen on and go to weather, 
and your mass is uh, over rotating, you're way over. Uh, you've got way too much iron. Or down. Or down. Yeah. That, oh, this is down. Can do it too, yeah. Because I was in Australia, and that's what it was. That's what I remember. Uh, yeah. Yeah. If, if you if you bring that down all on super tight, then yeah, it'll count. Kind of because a lot of the rate that Peter's talking about, that's that's extreme rate for a 16. And 10 years ago, we were never at 22 or 23. And if you don't know what that means, talk to us later, but yeah. it marks on your house. Yeah. But um, the, it, the down haul, it, it, like Will and Josh last weekend, you know, they came over and asked me, the mask was, was bent so bad. And I looked over and they had their down cranked all the way down on the beach. I mean, all the way down the black band. And I, I commented, I said, why is it so tight? Because with the mask being raked so far back now, a lot of these 16s, you can't bring the boom all the way down the black band, or you don't even need sheet tension. Right. So we're sailing with wrinkles. You're leaving that mm -hmm. down haul loose, and the boat's doing just fine. Yeah. It's just a little bit snug. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and uh, I don't know if we talk about, we don't talk about it now, we'll talk about it uh, uh, right now. Generally speaking, my understanding is you only really need an inch, inch and a half difference. You have one setting, and then when it blows, the, uh, the oysters off the rocks, or the dogs off the chains. Then you bring more downhaul on in the really heavy. Bringing more downhaul on depowers your rig. Just keep that in mind. Um, you want to, in, in, in flat water, you don't need a lot of power. And in choppy water, you need a lot of power to get through that chop. And I liken it to an 18 wheeler uh, one that's heavily loaded and one that's just deadheaded and empty and going back for another load. And in flat water, you want to be that empty 18-wheeler. You don't need a lot of power. And that 18-wheeler will hit a top end. But, uh, uh, it'll go a lot faster than one that's fully loaded until, you know, uh, a certain point. And I hope you're trying to draw that analogy. Um, if, and this is true if you have a heavy crew weight, you're like, you know, a fully loaded 18-wheeler. Uh, you need that power to get through, but it will also carry you. So a light crew, they might get stopped by some power in boat wake, and you'll be able to just carry that momentum through. Um, but, but basically, in salt water, you want more power than you do. In, uh, and there's a lot of different ways to gain that power. You can do it in the sail plan with your batten tension, the downhaul, less downhaul, um, mass rake, uh, more ma less mass rate. There's different ways that you can achieve that extra. Um, uh, uh, but for the most part, we don't change our, our just so you know, we don't change our mass rate whether we're in salt water or fresh water. So that's, that's one that we don't change, but we will make other adjustments and we may get into that in a little bit. So we're going to get into it right now. Batten tension for 20, 25 years, I didn't change batten tension. Uh, now, I make minor variations. You want to get really good at looking at your sail. And what I recommend is you stand at the base of your mast with your main sail up, down haul on, and just shoot your main in and out. Uh, when it's when it centered, and just look up and just see how that shape uh, changes and get to know it. Let that become your best friend. And just see how that shape changes. And you'll get a better understanding of, because of, that's your motor, man. That's that's your Ferrari to it. Um, and, and get good at looking at it. Look at other people's. Look at people who are at the front of the fleet. Look at their, what they're on the beach. Look at their uh, batting tension or their sail shape. Look at yours. Then look at other people's and get become a pro at your sail shape. Uh, that's why sail makers are often, are usually asked to come on boats because, you know, they, they're pros at it. There's a reason. Uh, in really heavy air, I mean, I saw a guy out of Lewis, Delaware, Mark Monterman, about two, uh, two years ago at a North Americans. They needed to do a videotape for a promo. And I mean, it wasn't blowing the ice off the rocks. It was blowing the rocks off the rocks. It was milking out there. And none of us were excited about it. But Mark and Rich McVeigh had already agreed to go out because Gary Johnson had a film crew there. 
So they went out. I mean, this thing, it was blowing 30. I'm, uh, if it wasn't blowing. Them. And these guys, went, I watched Mark Moderman. Well, he's from South Africa. And they don't go out unless it's at least 25. You know, I mean, it's just a lighter day. If it's not blowing, you know, <laughs> less than 20. And, and I watched Moderman set up his bones. And it was really telling. I mean, he was putting just the slightest amount of tension in, and it was just enough that he wouldn't rip his sails or whatever he wanted, the flattest sail possible. Um, there were, I took notes. I took copious notes. I don't have them here. I can tell you sometime the sailor police would like things like that. But the bottom line is that bad intention does make a difference. You want to set it up. I would recommend setting it up the same 99% of the time, 98% of the time. I make small variations. When it's nuking out there, I will lighten up the top two battens because there isn't much sail area up there anyhow. Um, and that's the biggest riding moment because it's really far away and it's going to tip you over. So we will lighten up those top two battens a little lighter when we're expecting it to be double trapped, overpowered, double trapped and then so. Any less than that, I usually set it up the same. Sometimes in salt water, I might squeeze it on just a skosh more. Um, and I mean just a skosh. Uh, but otherwise, it's pretty much the same. And you want to get good at what that is. You can even mark them. I have and I do. Um, this is a controversial one, this next topic. Uh, I talked about one of my strengths being, uh, being strong. I personally don't believe that I do this because, and I can do this because I am strong. But this is, I don't clean my main sheet at all, ever. All right, there's a few exceptions. Rarely do I, uh, do I ever upwind or downwind. And people say, oh, I can't hold it. You'll be surprised. If you roll your uh, six, six to one Harkin blocks up, at the bottom of your uh, cam clean, there is a bail. And when the, when the line comes out of the block and goes over that bail, that bail is a sharp edge, and it's actually really good at taking the pressure off of a main sheet. And I don't even notice it, all right? What that allows me to do is to play the sheet constantly. It's a game of inches, you guys. In the low, I'm down a couple inches. On that puff, I'm squeezing it on a couple of inches. And just with minor variations, they're going to gain me two or three inches over people who aren't playing the main sheet up with. Make sense? So for me, it's fun. I love doing it. Now, I mean, if you don't want to, you can just clean it off and have fun and just go up with it, and that's cool. But I like seeing if I can max it out. And I just like those little variations and stuff like that. Um, when we're trapped out, um, oh, this is a good tip. Say it's, uh, it, it's double trapped, and now you're getting into an overpower situation. If you're not block to block, when you're double trapped, you have the boat rigged wrong, or you have an old boat. But anymore, we're block to block, double trapped. Key point there. Now, let's say you have to, uh, and we will, adjust, we will travel out, but well, we travel out more than we should. We should really only travel out once or twice on an upwind leg, but we do it on puffs now. But here, here's, a, here's a training tip, then, a uh, little secret that I don't know if anybody else is doing or not. My crew holds the traveler, and I hold the main sheet. And, and when a puff hits, I'll say down two. I don't say down two. She doesn't know how much I want it down. I'll go down two. It means down two inches. We've worked out this communication system. Well, in the old days, she'd be sitting there, and she'd be doing one of these, trying to unclean the darn uh, the darn main traveler because it's fully loaded up. I've got my main sheet on and it's fully cleaned. When I say down to, I'm pulling on that main sheet. And what that does is it pulls the traveler up enough to unload the, tra the traveler cam clean so the crew can just go boop. You go, and then, so I go, I go down to, I bring it on, and remember, it's block to block. And the traveler doesn't really move. We're centered, probably, or it's heavily loaded. But I'm taking the pressure off of it enough that she can go boop. And when I see her go boop like that, 
than I let down to. And I'm still block to block, and you know, you know, she's trying to let it out, and I'm holding it up. So, so I go, you know, down two, I pull, down two, and then I pull again, so she can get that sheet down into the cut and clean again. And it's a cool, it's a, it works great. It's really cool when you get it down. You, you feel like a million bucks even if you know, I'm doing so well. Thanks. <laughs> uh, so um, the other thing is trapeze height. I want to talk about trap and axle. Most people are doing what I did for the first 10 or 20 years. And that is they're going out on the wire like a sack of potatoes. Clunk, and they just sit there. All right? And isn't it great? It is. Hobie cats are fantastic. Being out on the wire, there's nothing like it. Uh, but it's, you want to be active and dynamic. The low, when the low hits, we, I call it scooch hiking, we come in. The puff hits, we're bonus hiking. I mean, we can't do that all the time, that's hard on the back. So I only have my crew do it at the start for the first 30 to 45 seconds and at the leeward gate if there's boats around. And, and then it's just leaning out. And it's not just leaning out, you're pulling the boat down. You gotta pull on it, man. It just, you know, it, it's an active, it's not a passive deal. It's not something where you're just a sack of potatoes. That's a passive deal. It's an active pulling the boat down and keeping it flat. And then when that wall hits, you're constantly in and out. I watch YouTube videos all the time. I just view YouTube. If you ever get bored, I don't have television, so I, sometimes I get bored. I, I YouTube, YouTube, you can uh, metal races or uh, uh, sailing metal races or Sailing World Cup. You just watch video. I do this stuff all the time and it's great. And you watch these guys. And at the Olympic level, we're not all Olympians, I get that. <laughs> these guys are moving just one leg at a time. These guys have been coached for four years and they're just making small adjustments. Well, they can do that. Why can't we? So if you're into it, I highly recommend play with it, have fun with it. Um, I'm, I'm I'm playing with trying to kick the, the, the transom around right now on a puff to try to bring it in, um, you know, and just kind of dance on it uh, as you're going over waves. It's an act of fun. You're dancing with the boat. Be one with the boat. Be active in it. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot more fun than just sitting there. The other thing that you want to do when you're trapped out is, is uh, I think I'm getting into this. Yeah. Like, wow. It's almost like I, I want to talk about <laughs> Is you get into uh, into the posture, posture is so keen. When you're trapped out, when I trap out now, I actually I don't go out like this. Like if I'm on port tack with the tiller in hand and my seat in here, I don't go out like that. I go out like that. As soon as I get out, I rotate my hips, and now I'm pointed forward. This is an aggressive posture. This is passive. This is like, oh yeah, we're gonna go out, and you know it's Sunday. We're going to go to church, and maybe when we're done, we'll, you know, drop up. When you rotate and face forward, this is like, I want that. I'm going after it, okay? Um, and, and, and I'm leaning forward. My crew is right here, preferably below me so I can see. And what I do is I lean forward so I can look over her to see what's going on. And now I've got this forward, aggressive, I want to win kind of posture, not this, hey, what's going on? <laughs> All right. Um, the same goes true downwind. Although I've, I've adopted a sailing style now downwind where I've got my, my, my back to the course, I guess I can't see this, but I used to. And you want to be consciously presenting a fast approach to to, uh, uh, to the course. The other thing is tiller grip. I'm a really good driver. I have no compunction saying that. I'm not the best. I get that. But I'm better than a lot of them. And the reason I am, I think, is because I have learned the importance of the grip on the tiller. And John's, Johnny's a driver. And I'm, I'm 
I'm sure you'll, you'll count on them. You'll, you'll, you'll support this. In the, you want the lightest possible grip on the tiller that you can imagine. I was always amazed. I'm, I'm a Seattle Mariner fan. Edgar Martinez isn't yet, but will be, a Hall of Fame designated him. This guy, he had incredible eyesight. He studied pitches and all that. And this guy could, he could, I mean, these pitches would throw it away from him and he would go down there and stroke it for a double or a home run or something. The guy was just incredible. It never failed to amaze me how many times the, ball, the bat would fly out of Edgar's hands into the stands or into the dugout. It was incredible. And it's because Edgar had such a light grip and he was relaxed. All right? Now, in a heavy breeze, you have a firmer grip. All right? But a, you want to have as light as you can. And the reason you want it is devil's in the details. You want to feel what's going on over those rudders. The rudders are your break. If you're going slow, it's because probably of the rudders. It could be in some other things, but in the water, and you want to feel what's happening. That's why we lift one rudder up. I'll give you another little uh, little tip here. We all sail downwind, most of us sail downwind with one rudder up, right? It's not for the wetted surface area, you guys. I used to think it was for the wetted surface area. It's not the wetted surface area. It's so that you can load one all of the steering onto one rudder and feel the water flowing over that one rudder. And now, instead of your rudder adjustments, if this is center line, if you have both rudders in the water, you might uh, only, you know, you might only make that much of a rudder adjustment, let's just say. And with just with both rudders in. And now with one rudder adjust, with only one rudder in there, you might have to go out that much to make that same adjustment. Well, that's, anybody who's been sailing like that knows that that's slow. The more you get your rudders off center line, the more it, it, you're breaking the boat. But here's the t difference. Is after time, you will learn and feel the boat. And you will be making the adjustment a lot sooner. And now you'll be right back to there. And you've only got one rudder in the water breaking you and not the two. Does that make sense? When you have two rudders in the water and they're offset by that much, it's like having one rudder this much. But now you have the opportunity to close that gap down to where you only have one rudder in the water and you're hopefully doing making minor adjustments because you're anticipating, you're feeling, you're you're doing all this stuff. Does that make sense? Jump in any time, John. Uh, the other thing that you know, I talked about, never cleaning. Oh, going back to the uh, never cleaning. As soon as I went to the never cleaning, I stopped pitch pulling. You're talking to the king of pitch pull right here. I invented it. All right? and, uh, and I, well, maybe I didn't invent it, but I definitely perfected it. And... The reason I was pitch pulling all the time, I'd be out there in 20 knots and being kind of, you know, I was always living close to the edge. Oh boy, this is fun. And as soon as that puff would hit, I'd be sitting there trying to uncleat my mane. And by the time I'm doing this, we're in. All right. As soon as I stopped cleaning my mane, as soon as that puff hits, boom. I'm instantly sheeting off, and I can't tell you how many times it saved my bacon. And I don't, I don't pitch pull anymore. I did a smock hole once with that, uh, this last past year, but that's uh, because my main blocks were all messed up. But, but not cleaning your main will save you tons um, downwind because a you won't pitch pull. That's pretty fast. Uh, not pitch pull, and because now you can uh, you can play your main downwind too. I didn't talk about that kind of coming at this. I play the main upwind and downwind. I remember Emiliano down in Argentina. He says, Peter, in some broken English, goes, play your main. What do you mean, Emiliano? I've been, I've been telling, I've been doing and telling others, you just lock off your main and sail to this, sail to 90 degrees of pair and have your main set out. No, you play your main. 
And what Emiliano said in his broken Spanish, and I really don't understand it, but it sort of makes sense, is he says, no, man, you want, you want to break the wind off of the, off of the sails. You want to break it and reattach the breeze that's going over the sails. And by adjusting the, the sails constantly, you can, you can achieve that. And so now, what, what I do is I gradually, I grab the main sheet from, uh, in medium air or lighter, from behind the main blocks, because I can't do it through the blocks. And you'll see me, I got my butt up against the boom, which isn't fast, because I'm looking back, and, and I, I'm bending around, and now I just do this all the time. You will see me constantly working that. Uh, am I fast? I'm faster, and I'm getting better, because I'm practicing it. When you do anything initially, it takes a little while to get used to it. Because the other thing that happens, you guys, that, I'm, that uh, is, it, let's say I'm sailing downwind, and a puff hits, and uh, let's say I am sailing downwind, and I've got my, my mane is mm. out here, wings over here, 90 degrees apparent. And let's say I get a puff and I want to steer down here. All right? Well, what I do is I let out the mane and I'm pulling on the tiller so that the boat will carve down. What happens is when I let out the mane that much, I am unloading the rudders. If you know what I mean by loading and unloading, it means that the water doesn't have the same force on it, the speed. And so now my rudders, here's my rudders, but by unloading them, there's more of a turning moment and less of a braking moment, if that makes sense. If you don't know what I mean, I don't know if I can explain it. This is one of those things, well, I'll just do it. But, but it means that, um, yeah, it helps the boat turn without breaking. So I will ease off, you know, I'll just, like that, while I'm turning, while I'm turning down, and then I bring it back on. And it's a game of inches, and I'm just gaining inches at a time. Okay? I think what you're trying to say, too, is the boat will turn itself. Yes. If, right? You don't have to yeah. force the boat to go down. He's in the main out, a little bit on the rudder, and the boat will steer down and fast instead of breaking. Excellent. Okay, and hopefully that's well said things. You're going, you're going to say something like that. Um, so Jerry is asking a good question. So he says, is that because the jib's loading more? Yes. Um, yeah. The, the, when the puff hits, the boat wants to do something. It it's either wants to shoot forward, down, or up. And that's all dependent on that. One, how your sails are trimmed, and then second, where your rudders are. And that what generally will happen, and what Peter was saying is, when the puff hits, the first thing that happens is the rudder will load up. Because on a, like, on a 16, now on a 18 might be a little different because of the dagger boards, but the 16, the boat wants to do something. Generally, it wants to steer down, but you'll be fighting it, holding it. So as that rudder loads up with force, the, the jib, yes, the jib will get the wind, it'll hit the wind, and it'll want to pull the boat down if you let the main out. The main stays in, then the main's going to want to counteract the jib. It's going to bring you up. So, so it's a balance. So, so what you probably do in that situation is you don't have the crew necessarily turn the jib out right away in the pot if the tailpipes are being affected. Leave it in, but let the main out, and the boat will rotate down. It'll just turn itself. Would that be the same one? Yeah, you're going to let daggers down. Now when the daggers are up anyhow. And we're going to get into sailing, I hope, we'll get into sailing with the sails in, during the starting sequence, because um, uh, I've got, a, I've got a, a proven, really, cakewalk starting method that uses the sails to help you start. And uh, we'll get into that. But basically, yeah, Paul? I just want to ask a question. We've talked a lot about continually cleaning the main sail, but what would you say about the crew who would have to do So... It's a good question, uh, Paul. Uh, so, for anybody watching the tape, I got Johnny Hope here. I got Paul Carter, and these guys um, are. I'm chasing them all, all around the pond up here in the Pacific Northwest, or out on the national race course all the time, and they're very accomplished. Uh, and so, Paul is saying, well, uh, asking, uh, and I know Paul knows the answer. But he wants me to cover, 
what is it, what's the crew doing in that situation? And typically what happens to us when we're dealing with a pup is actually, it's a delayed reaction. The puppet comes on and we allow our boat speed to build, but it's only a fraction of it because these boats build speed so quickly because they're so light. So usually it's almost an instantaneous thing. And then I just have my crew, she'll trim the sails and usually she will also go out with them as the boat turns down. But initially, she might have to uh, come in because as the boat builds, uh, builds speed, the apparent wind goes forward. Does that make sense? Because you're building speed, so the apparent wind goes forward, and that's why you're bear, uh, bearing off to come down. And so she'll, uh, I don't know what she does, but I think she uh, will, uh, she'll, she'll come in and then let it back out. And I don't bring mine in so much on the puff, because it's so instantaneous, and I'm usually just letting it happen. Upwind? Oh, upwind, this is what's downwind. Upwind, usually the, the jib will stay locked. We will adjust, uh, last weekend we were up on a lake sailing. Uh, it was very puffy. We adjusted the jib upwind, we adjusted that whole weekend, three or four times the whole weekend, um, I think. We usually leave it pretty set and just sail to it. We're not adjusting, but the main I'm constantly adjusting. Um, and there was a good comment that uh, John made Saturday night that I used Sunday to advantage, and that is, when in doubt, let it out. And this is uh, this is not in the double trap heavy stuff. Well, maybe so if you're going to go over. But this was in light and medium air, and you know the tendency is, I man. If I'm sheeting in, we're going fast. So if I sheet in a little bit more, it makes sense that I would go faster. <laughs> it doesn't work that way, all right? And you have to have leech telltales to tell you, and that's a whole different story. Well, is that just because you're over-sheeting and spilling food? You just bump in the wind out? Yes, exactly. Okay, so. Yeah. You want the, the boat to breathe, I think, a warner. Let the boat breathe. But, um, and there's a balance in there. Well, yeah, you want to loosen it up. So she's, she's goosed and she wants to just jump out uh, and not so bound up. Uh, something that I don't think is talked about much is, well, where do you look? You're out there, you're a skipper or crew. I'm gonna, for time purposes, I'm probably going to focus on just the skipper for now. You're out there and you're racing. Well, where do you look? I mean, you know, well, I can, I can guarantee you this. If you went out, got off the beach and you found out that you're the slow boat and you're spending your whole day looking at your telltales and how you can make your boat go faster, you're not going to go very fast, all right? The time to do all that, yeah, you spend, I would recommend spending 10, 15 minutes, uh, you know, speed testing, going out there, seeing where your boat is. Once you get your boat dialed in, it is what it is for that particular race or that particular day. Or those conditions and you're just gonna have to live with it but I have a bad habit and I look at my lured Paul I think it's from all those times <laughs> no no please not again um, and you know it's, it's just incredible and we all have these bad habits but what's gonna happen is you'll find, you want to look at the water that's your primary uh, area to look at. Um, you want to look at waves. You want to steer. You're looking for flat water. Now, if I'm sailing on a lake and it's like today, there's probably not a lot to look at because it's, it's flat out there on a lake today. So that, I'm saying that. I guess I'm saying that in salt water. I'm looking at the. I'm looking at the in salt water. I'm looking at the water. 60% of the time, maybe, more than half, because I'm steering around. And I used to think that you wanted to reduce your rudder movements, because those are your brakes. In salt water especially, I'm watching these guys, these Olympic athletes on YouTube, and they are just moving their tiller wherever they need to. You're looking for whatever will get you around, them, and you're steering around those hills and those valleys, and you're looking for flat water, upwind or downwind. There's times when downwind you want you want the steeper waves because you can surf on them. But unless you can surf, if you can't surf, you're looking for flat water. 
Because the boat will go faster in flat water than it will doing one of these things. Right? But if it's doing one of these things, you probably have a pretty good chance downwind of surfing. Uh, but otherwise, so in salt water, yeah, about 60% in the water, maybe 20% of the time uh, I'm looking at the sails, and then 20% of the time I'm looking at where the competition is. Uh, but you don't want to be looking at your sails all the time. Uh, it's, it's, you get into a rhythm of just looking out at the water, and then when you see a flat spot coming, you maybe you take a look at your sails, make sure they're good, keep steering, next flat spot, well, what's Johnny doing over there, what's Paul doing over there, you know, and, and then back to you know, steering through the water and stuff like that. Uh, Keep your legs together, keep your crew together. You know, you don't need to trap out like this, all right? It's very stable, but you really don't. You're, uh, you, they should be about shoulder width apart. And if you, Laura and I have not gotten to the point yet, but we want to get to a point where she's tucking a leg, her, uh, her, rear, her rear leg behind my front leg, uh, but we're not there yet. I might, you so, a chop. I might, yeah, a little bit away when they go out, you get a little, a little bit out, yeah. So you don't have a tendency to feel like you're going to get thrown over the back or anything? No, well, I do. If you watch my thrills, chills, and spills, <laughs> I'm off the back <laughs> end. So I do have that tendency. Um, and so now what, what we're going to try to do in those situations is have Laura grab my life vest and hold on to the, uh, the life vest. But that's going to be quite a bit for her because she's got the gym sheet to keep us from going, from her from going back. But now she also has the traveler, so she'll probably end up having to drop that traveler and grab, and grab me. Well, look, so she's travel. She's got travel on right hand and on left hand, so she's really stable. Does she end up catching you at all with a heavy job? Like she'll bump, she'll, she bumps me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's stopping you from... No, she bumps me sometimes off the boat. That's, <laughs> that's why we're trying to get her to hold on. It's all her fault. That's a Skipper attitude thing, though. Oh. Nicer, she wouldn't be bumping the bus. Yeah. Well, and Skipper attitude, me, yeah, I wouldn't be throwing her under the bus either. <laughs> um, yeah, but I'm, I'm teasing on that. Um, well, there's a lot. Of, I mean, there's a lot of factors that play into that. And one is <clears throat> Jennifer and I do a lot of the leg lock in the big breeze. So she'll come back and she'll tuck her leg behind my forward leg. And then with the two of us kind of pushing against each other, you get some stability that way. Um, but secondly, if your crew's getting knocked back into you, you need to raise their trapeze height, right? And that's probably something you're going to get into. But we learned that at North Americans this year in Mexico. The top fast guys had all raised their trapezes up. And we were out in the first race, and we were way down low, getting knocked off the boat constantly. You know, and I looked at some of the top guys, and instantly we picked that up, that they're all lifting up. And they had all put double clips on their trapeze. We tried to raise ours, we slid right back down to the original spot over and over. So you may be getting into that, but that's, no. that's something that if your crew's getting knocked back into the skipper, they're probably too low. Yeah. And I, I wasn't going to get into it because it I, I passed over and I attended to trapeze height. Right. What, what, what John just mentioned. But also, we will raise our trapeze height when we think it's going to be a light air day. Because we don't need all that leverage, but we might be able to trap out when others can't, and and that has its own advantages too. So, uh, so the trapeze height is not something that is just a static deal either. And that's way yes. easy to adjust on the fly. No, is there a fly? you have to do it between races. Well, they, you can. There is an adjustable trap. Yeah. I don't know if it's class legal. I don't know if it's class legal. On the F-18s we do it, but yeah. I don't know if we, I've never done it on a 16. No. Okay. Or an 18. Uh, as, as, this is all under a boat speed while you're sailing or once you get out there. You want to evaluate what kind of day it is. You thought on the beach it was going to be this kind of a day. Is it? You have to make adjustments to what you thought. Talk about to your crew about it. Um, start looking at, are the puffs 
um, uh, uh, starboard lifts or headers. Typically in the northern hemisphere, a puff will veer to the right, typically. But, but locale being what it is, don't take that as a, as a, as a gospel, all right? So you want to look, is it a lift or is it a header? Um, how big are the lifts? Is there any timing to those lifts? Because that might be important at the start, you know? Go, well, they're coming in every two or three minutes, hmm, you know, uh, and, and stuff like that. So um, you, um, you want to, if you can, find a sailing buddy, find somebody that's pretty comparable to you, and go, maybe go out in different ways. We did this in Puerto Penasco with Tommy K, uh, with Coors, and, uh, and you just go out there one day, and you know, come back, well, which side was favored, that sort of thing. But you can also just do speed testing, you know, and make adjustments. Be creative. Try things. Something that we have learned also is that in a big breeze with a medium to heavy breeze with a big chop, we will loosen our jib. And the bows do not dig in nearly as much. The boat floats over instead of getting pounded in there. That, Laura picked that one up uh, in Fiji in a, in a huge bend. Uh, so if you find your boats constantly hitting those waves, loosen the jib off. Doesn't take much, an inch, inch and a half. And if you think that I'm kind of crazy, Jerry um, um, got, has um, footage of Kike, uh, Kike Figueroa having his crew doing the same thing on the starter ley line. But I think he was doing that. He had her doing that. Guy named, it wasn't Carl, it was someone else crewing for him. I think she was actually doing it to unload. Laura will do this too. Before we get into the mark, a lot of times she will pop the cleat and then re-cleat it. Because what happens is the cleat just gets bound and bound and bound and bound. And then when it's time to go around the mark, there's high wind. Your pair of wind goes up. The wind speed goes up. being shown on the jib. And now it gets loaded up even more. And the crew's over there, God, can't get it out. And the bows are doing one of these. <laughs> the pucker factor's going up, you know? And so she will, uh, when, it, when, when she feels like uh, we've been on starter ley line for a long time, she'll, um, she'll uh, unclean that jib and re-clean it just to reset the, uh, the cam so she knows she'll be able to release it when she 